think something new under the sun. Mm. You can't take back them things you already done, done. No. You blame things that you do on somebody else. back to our show from the Berlin Design Week and uh, today on our Saturday evening show. And uh, it was a very nice evening yesterday and we had so much fun and uh, we want to say thank you to all the people who were writing comments beneath the uh, Facebook accounts, the YouTube accounts and thanks Berlin. We are now also on Twitter. So if you like... You can join us over Twitter and um, write down your questions if you have them for the keynotes. Or if you want to join our uh, show, you can also ring the number of our studio. And what's the name of the show? <laughs> Hi Ludwig. Oh, wait a moment. Um, you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> ah, there you are. It's a lot of sun behind me and uh, beside you. So we are so far away from each other, but <laughs> at, at the same at the same planet. How was your day, and how how was the day in Berlin today? 
Yeah, the weather is great. Uh, the city is still crowded and people in the parks and, you know, having a, a beer or ice cream. So it's, it's, it's a great, great time to celebrate. It's opening up in Germany at least. And the last days, a um, lot of people were writing, um, hey, we, we missed something. And we were, sp we were asking, well, what are you missing? They don't say anything. And um, today we found the idea. We miss someone. Look, who is here tonight <laughs> and joining our team? <laughs> Hi, Gamu. Hi. Welcome. How are you? Thank I'm great. Thanks. How are you doing? Today? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I thanks being here and uh, being part of our team. Um, Ludwig, what we can say about Gamu? Oh, uh, <laughs> maybe she can <laughs> she can talk about herself. But uh, she is member of the Moving School team since a year now, and a very lovely person to work with. So, Gamu, do you want to say something about yourself? Yes, definitely. Uh, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here finally after two days of missing the show. Um, so for those of you who don't know me yet, my name is Gamu. I come from Zimbabwe and I'm currently studying English, American Studies and Business. And I've just finished my coaching training. So I'm focusing on uh, women empowerment coaching. And I think it's, it's a very great addition that I'm here today because I think we can have Uh, many ideas of how we can include more women in things like this. So thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Looking forward to the evening. And you have uh, watched the last two shows. And uh, what do you say about yesterday's show? There was a lot of women power inside. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a very important topic. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there, but I think uh, entrepreneurship is something that women should be focusing more on because I believe that we have great ideas. We just need that little extra push. Um, I think it was a very perfect topic. Thank you for hosting it yesterday. Yeah. But Ludwig, we have, all, uh, we have a bad news for tonight that because one woman we will miss. And because... <laughs> Well, first of all, I think we yeah. should start with the good news because we have <laughs> Alpha Bain in the show tonight. Um, and uh, that's that's a really great gift. Uh, we will see him in a moment. There he is. Hello, Alf. Great to see you. And uh, that makes it uh, Easter and Christmas in one day today. So thank you for coming and giving us a talk. We will talk a little bit more later. And yeah, the thing is that Carolina uh, is is not well, so she will not be live here tonight, but um, she sent us some, some music. Uh, and so we can listen to her great voice and her band. So so that's that's I'm looking forward to that also very much because I like her a lot. Uh, she's a great singer. And she was here actually starting moving school in 2012 with us. Yeah, so we will celebrate her um, in a few minutes with a video and we, uh, she sent it to us. And um, Alf Rehn is um, from Copenhagen today. How is, it, how is it over there in Copenhagen? The weather and the people... <laughs> Today has been actually one of the first really warm days in Copenhagen. Uh, it's been very sunny, which you might spot from my face because I've been able to be outside for the first time in a very long time. Uh, it's getting busy. I live in uh, the very heart of Copenhagen, the most central touristy area. So um, it's getting uh, even annoyingly busy. Uh, lots of people milling about and enjoying the sunshine. But uh, you take the bad with the good. <laughs> That's true, and um, uh, we will hear something from you as a keynote. And uh, Ludwig wants to mm -hmm. say something in uh, advance before you st you're starting. Mm -hmm. Ludwig Alfred, uh, where you met him the first time, and um, <laughs> <wha> <laughs> well, it's it's actually one of those uh, people you meet on 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 the internet. So we had, uh, you know, some contacts before in the past years. And uh, I actually, I think I, I met him the first time in his, in his book, you know. Uh, this is a German edition on dangerous ideas. Uh, 
you know, I have to, for my, for my job teaching also innovation, creativity here in the University of Kassel, I've also had like, have such a one or two shelves of these innovation books and entrepreneurship books. And I thought, okay, there's another one. Uh, I like the title and uh, the, the hand grenade on it <coughs> uh, because I didn't know him. So, but when I, when I read this book, I thought, okay, this is really different. Uh, it's not uh, boring or uh, repeating what I've read so far. And he, he is really a, a really good writer, great, great language. And also, you know, with surprising ideas and a very good person to observe what's going on in companies. So I recommend this book. And here's the second book. It's called uh, Innovation for the Fatigued, How to Build a Culture of Deep Creativity. Uh, that is what we can observe in, you know, when in companies or organizations, somebody's coming like a workshop leader and say, okay, today we doing some innovation for this company or oh, not again, you know, so, um, <laughs> so that's the innovation fatigue because we use that so often. And in the end, it's nothing new or it's really, really boring. And he's really describing that very well and very uh, detailed. Also, what I liked about this book is uh, to see that changes have a lot to do with uh, personal relationships and the atmosphere in a company. And um, what he will, or what he, I, I asked him to talk about, I don't know what's, if that is really going to happen, but what, what really touched me was this uh, talking about uh, deep creativity versus shallow creativity or innovation. So, you know, what is, what is really, what, what do we need these days? I mean, there's so many ideas, but which of them are really, you know, worthy to follow? Uh, where, sh where should we put our energy in? So I'm hopefully uh, listening more today. But so he is a professor of innovation design and management in the University of Southern Denmark. And um, <clears throat> he likes gin as he, <laughs> he wrote in his CV. Um, and uh, Alf, you are a research professor, right? So you, you're mainly doing research? Well, I do teach as well. I, I teach quite a lot and I supervise. I'm, I'm a head of section and I am a kind of, in Denmark, we don't have pure research professors. You can buy yourself out of teaching, but I often think that that's a bit of a cheap move. I like teaching. I think it's important to engage with uh, students and uh, uh, kind of get their perspectives on things. But uh, yes, my main job is research. And, can and you also tell? you... Yeah. Okay. And you do you a lot tell? of yeah. uh, <laughs> you do a lot of um, consulting also with companies. Um, is is this a is yeah. this a very fruitful job, or do you get annoyed by the you know things that change so so slow? Well, uh, there are there are different kinds of consultants. My I always say that my. Um, I've, I've been a very lucky man. So I am a full professor. I get a full salary from the university, which means I do take on some advisory work and uh, help companies. Uh, but I've never had to grovel in front of a company and say, please, please, please give me work. Uh, so I only take on work I think is interesting. I only take on work that I think is fun. And uh, I've had situations where CEOs have come, uh, you're going to come in and you're going to do this. And I go, no. And they go, what? But we'll pay you. I say, it doesn't matter. I'm, my kids will not go hungry if I say no to you. I, I'm, I have a salary I can manage. I don't want to do that. I'm not interested in that problem. I'm not interested uh, in necessarily your company. And um, that means that I am kind of see myself more as a free spirit. Yes, I have worked with many, many corporations. I've worked with governments. I've worked with the, the European Union. I've worked with uh, the weirdest kinds of uh, global corporations and transnational organizations, but always on my terms. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a certain freedom one can have when one is fully tenured as a professor, and I've tried to make the most of it. Mm -hmm. Stefan, you had a question? 
Yeah, just um, because of uh, teaching and um, how is the situation in, in university, we always ask uh, our guests um, how it is at the moment. Uh, is something changing? Is the pandemic um, situation better solved at the moment? And how, how is it in Copenhagen? Yeah. In, in Denmark, students are now allowed to go back to the university, but of course, all our courses are finished for the academic year, so, so that's more that they get to work in the labs. I think that the pandemic situation has, uh, I mean, it's been a struggle for a lot of teachers. Uh, we've had to move to online uh, teaching. Uh, almost all my teaching for the last 12 months have been completely online, as has supervision. And I think when we're going to look back at this, I think we're going to say that there actually was a, a silver lining to a really, really terrible situation because even my most traditional and conservative colleagues now know how to handle online teaching. And we've been able to find ways to engage with people over uh, networks. And uh, I found that supervision, for instance, can become actually even more efficient online uh, than with the usual uh, people shuffling in and out of your office. So, um, yeah, it's been a struggle at times, but I think that uh, this might have helped universities to find new and at times at least better ways of working. <clears throat> Okay, but don't you think that beside that like innovation or a new situation of doing more online that the uh, the didactic on teaching and university is really lacking a lot of uh, spirit, a lot of creativity? There's, there are, of course, negatives. Nobody doubts that there are negatives. And, and Lord knows there have been situations where I kind of looked at my own teaching videos and gone, oh my God, this is boring. I can't do the examples. I can't do the Q&As. I can't do the interactive bits. Of course, it's different. Uh, and that's why I say I think this should be seen as a learning opportunity. There is forms of teaching that can be very well translated into an online environment and even improve in an online environment. Mm -hmm. I found that, for instance, rather than what I normally do, which is give 90-minute lectures, which can work if you're one-on-one -on -one or, or one too many in a lecture hall, I translate a lot of interviews to 15 to 20-minute uh, video clips. And that mm -hmm. forced me into a different kind of teaching. And a lot of the students actually liked that. They liked getting kind of more kind of slotted teaching, uh, slightly more kind of prepackaged stuff, being able to go back and say, what the heck did Alf ramble about now? Uh, as, as one of them pointed out, after listening to your video three times, I think I know what you meant. Uh, which might be a, a condemnation of my teaching, uh, but at least they had a chance to go back three times and, uh, and learn at their own pace. So mm. I think that the future of teaching uh, will be hybrid. I think that we all uh, now look forward to being able to be in the same physical space, to be able to kind of work with our hands and, and really kind of engage. But we've also found that some things can be done very elegantly uh, over uh, online platforms. Uh, mm. So right now, on Tuesday, uh, about 10 of my students have to submit their master's thesis. And they've all been thrilled about Zoom because now, instead of mailing me, can I come and meet you on Monday, <laughs> reserving a one hour thing, they send me these kind of pings, uh, kind of, over, hey, uh, can you kind of hop on Zoom for three minutes? I have one question, literally one question. Okay. Then I hop on, then we deal with that, they hop off again, and we go about our merry way. So we've learned new ways of collaboration. We've learned that not all supervision doesn't need to be 10 one-hour sessions. Sometimes it's, hey, should I do this or this? Uh, and then I go, do that. Thanks. Off again. One-minute supervision. Uh, so I'm not saying that, oh, online is the only way. I'm saying mm. we should find the benefits from new ways of working. Because Ludwig, as you well know, I'm a big believer in trying stuff out. Some things mm. don't work then you dump that things. Some things work really well. Uh, then, then you kind of keep doing those things and we muddle through. Mm. Uh, and I mean, I think 
also, which which I think is is quite nice, is that, uh, and it, it links to what our uh, delightful colleague here pointed out about uh, female empowerment. Uh, there is often in a classroom environment this thing, uh, in many of the classes I've taught, I'm not saying it's universal, uh, in engineering schools where you have the very loud boys at the t <laughs> front of the class who, who simply kind of dominate the conversation and uh, the, the quiet girl at the back doesn't really come through. A lot of that disappears when you're in an online uh, space mm -hmm. where uh, the quiet girl has many ways to, to kind of bring her question through chat boxes, through emails, through a WhatsApp comment, uh, through kind of linking with me on LinkedIn and saying, oh, listen, I don't want to ask in class, but I'm going to ask through this instead. So, I mean, there are benefits to online teaching. I think those, and I think those should be celebrated. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I feel that in curious as it may seem with some students, um, I think the possibility of, uh, for instance, being able to meet on a Sunday, because, well, in these lockdown days, uh, <laughs> all days become pretty similar, uh, and having a very kind of chill, uh, I've had my coffee, I didn't I need to go to the office, we could just sit here and kind of shoot the breeze, uh, has brought me closer to students. Not all mm. of them, uh, but some mm. of them. And um, yeah, uh, also, and this also connects a little bit to, to kind of the notion of, of female empowerment. One thing that I'm, I'm often struggling with uh, is, of course, the power dynamics of supervision or the power dynamics of teaching. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, where you are in a room, you are there, present, an older white man with a title. It's very kind of who I'm the boss, sit down, shut up, listen. Uh, in an online environment, some of these things disappear. So, mm -hmm. so at least mm -hmm. some of my female students have, have clearly kind of felt that this is now, this has democratized our conversation. And I love that. I'm mm -hmm. a huge fan of that democratization uh, because, I mean, I am the age I am, I am the gender I am, I am the, the vocation I am. I can't really change that. But, uh, but I'm a feminist at heart and, uh, and often find, my, find that the power dynamics that we create in, in teaching environments and, and in lecture mm. halls are, are troubling to me. Mm. Uh, so so I, I kind of, anything that lessens that uh, male professor speak is to me a, a great bonus and and the online teaching has to me brought about that oh. Gamo, Gamo, is this yeah, your experience Gamo. too yes <laughs> i'm actually thinking i love to hear that because i know from the conversations that i have with ludwig sometimes this is what we are constantly talking about that how can we lessen you know this gap that is there that there are certain women with so much potential but they don't trust themselves, you know, to come forward to say, hey, this is what I want done. This is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and you saying that actually gives me confidence that, you know what, it's possible. We are coming forward. We can do something. And this is the time that we have uh, been waiting for. So thank you for saying that. I love that power. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, it's, it's, uh, so, so one of the things I teach, and Ludwig doesn't know this, uh, is, is I teach gender theory and queer theory to, to engineering students. Oh. Uh, and, and you haven't really fully lived until you've taught queer theory to male engineers. It is hilarious <laughs> uh, to, to really kind of talk about gender as performative, to go into a bit of Judy Butler, to kind of bring in uh, the history of feminism. Uh, because my students, they are not, even though they are sometimes are a little, originally a little myopic when it comes to gender issues, uh, they are actually uh, very quick to take on these kinds of issues. They are not, uh, we have this kind of thing, oh, male engineering students are all in one way. No, my male engineering students, the only reason they haven't really engaged with feminism is nobody taught them anything about it. Or if somebody taught them, it was not done by somebody that they felt that they had an innate trust with. I come in, uh, I look a bit like their dads uh, because they're basically the, the age of my kids and, uh, and, and kind of talk about this and, and kind of give them examples where it's not just uh, do not sexually harass, 
uh, and instead kind of talk about, okay, so what happens in an organization where we don't actually engage with all the potential? What happens if we, by our language, uh, simply kind of uh, exclude certain people? Uh, or when we had a spirited conversation about why can't men wear dresses? Because in it's coming to summer now, and and summer can get really hot. And the, frankly, a dress is really comfortable in summer. I am not kind of comfortable enough to actually wear one, but I look <laughs> at uh, women in their summer dresses and I go, "That's a lot more comfortable <laughs> than what I have on." I mean, I'm walking here in bloody jeans and feeling uncomfortable. My thighs are chafing. A floral dress would look terrible <laughs> on me, but I'd be more comfortable. It would be look great on you. <laughs> and uh, I, I do have the legs, but uh, they're quite hairy. Um, and then you talk <laughs> with the students and, and kind of talk about this. And, and sure, you use humor and you use kind of a kind of a bit of silliness in there. And they go, "Yeah, that's actually that's that's right. A dress sounds really comfortable, actually." And and they kind of start processing why, because it's just cloth. It's not nothing about a dress is inherently genetically male or female. It is just clothing. In a lot of cultures, Scotland, uh, various parts of uh, Asia, you will have loose fitting flowing robes or similar uh, for male dress and there's nothing weird about it. But if I would turn up to this con this kind of little uh, get together in a floral summer dress, I would probably have gotten pretty weird looks, even from Ludwig, and he's a very tolerant man. <laughs> how, how did you get this idea of teaching that? Because um, uh, is this about like uh, personal formation of students? Is, is, uh, why did you get into the subject for engineers? Well, uh, it is, I maintain that creativity and innovation is all about perspectives. It is all about trying to understand variance in perspectives. And that means that I study the most weird things, but all the things I study are really about borders. Borders about uh, what's legal and illegal. Why is something illegal and therefore not worthy of study, whereas other things are legal and therefore you can study them. Uh, why do we listen more to the young than to the old in many cultures? Whereas in other cultures, you listen more to the old than to the young. Where does the border go between old and young? And gender mm -hmm. is just another delineation. And mm -hmm. what I so what I do is I look to various kinds of, let's say, epistemological perspectives, if you want to have a fancy word for it, and say, okay, how can we question this? So if you remember dangerous ideas that you showed up, show up, I, I kind of use a little bit of queer theory in there to kind of, when I kind of uh, point to uh, make up for men, uh, which L'Oreal actually started exploring and actually the, that expanded into their skincare range for men, which expanded into an entire universe of uh, things that are not strictly makeup as we traditionally understand it, but which are sort of male makeup go into any kind of place that sells uh, these kinds of products and you'll see 17 kinds of razors, 800 kinds of shaving cream, moisturizers for every singular part of the male face, and, uh, and uh, all of them uh, kind of uh, sold with the, the notion, no, no, this is very masculine. But it started from a very queer perspective saying, why, do not, why don't we sell makeup to men? So when I teach, for instance, gender theory or I teach queer theory, I always do it. And this is not trying to say you should become another gender. This is not saying you should explore your sexuality. If you want to do that, it's not none of my business. Go right ahead. I'm liberal that way. But it's about trying to understand difference in the world. Because we get if we get as male get better at understanding what it means or, or my, how it might feel to be female, that gives us another opening into what, how is knowledge created and how is knowledge gendered? Uh, how might a slight shift, for instance, thinking about male makeup or men in dresses, might show us something about the world that we haven't seen before? 
So if you want to simplify it, uh, this is actually creativity techniques at the very heart. It's just creativity mm. techniques deployed in a way that are, isn't really well known to that many people. <laughs> How do the women in your course like that? I mean, oh, they love it because anything uh, that makes the men uncomfortable, they are absolutely adore. So they sit there and kind of giggle and go, "Yeah, now you know." <laughs> uh, so, so for instance, uh, I do, and and this is this is like in courses on technological change. Uh, one of the historical cases I use, which is absolutely wonderful because you can really kind of push people's buttons the development of the tampon now the tampon is rarely discussed in creativity innovation and design uh, because it's considered a very private thing uh, but at the same time uh, as all women know life without tampons would have been pretty grim it is a really nice innovation it is quite handy uh, for a couple of days a month uh, but the development of the tampon is actually a really complex story. Uh, you usually have to go back and kind of understand historically how menstruation was dealt with. And uh, you have to kind of go back to various kinds of not always that sanitary products. And uh, how, does you, how do you market an unmentionable object and go on. And again, you haven't fully lived until you talk in detail about menstruation to mainly male engineering students. They get a tiny bit pale in the face. They kind of go, la, 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 la. I don't want to hear anymore. And the, and the women kind of sit there again and giggle and go, finally, somebody talks about something that makes sense to me. Now, and I'm not saying this as oh, I'm this fantastic gender warrior. Uh, I just like to take examples that not every kind of almost 50-year-old male professor of innovation takes up and kind of engage with students. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, uh, for instance, some students, and this is completely not due to me, they, they was do, were doing this completely uh, before I actually had them in my class, uh, and are working on creating more sustainable tampons, because tampons, which you may or may not know, are, are actually uh, an environmental issue. Uh, I mean, they, uh, they basically, they don't compost very well, uh, and they are used more than most men actually realize, and, uh, and they have a... Um, uh, there's a sustainability price to them. So, so there are some students from my university who are now working on solving that problem, which I think is fantastic. This is the exact kind of stuff that I want to see students working with, uh, taking a real problem that has been marginalized by media and the powers that be and, and try to shift the world, if ever so little, by engaging with it. Mm. Well, that's a great... Uh bridge to your talk I guess and uh, but before so you can prepare have a little bit of time thank you it's a it's a great uh, it's not a detour really uh, because Gamu is expert on that Gamu you can say what what is your speciality in coaching also yeah uh, let me start about talk, let, let me start by talking about the menstruation part. Uh, I actually founded this Zenzela project in 2018 because of uh, menstrual poverty. That is a problem in Zimbabwe. So our main aim is to try and eradicate this problem. And it's a very good thing that you talked about the sustainability part of it, because I think it's always important that we come up with sustainable ways, right? When it comes to things that are natural and things that we need from day to day. Um, so I think I would really want to know more about that and look into how can we provide something that's sustainable, especially to countries like Zimbabwe, where I uh, originally come from. And with my coaching, I think that also uh, motivated me to go into coaching as well, because I've been working with different women. They, talk, they talked about disposable uh, pets, and they also talked about the ones where you actually have to wash them and then reuse them. I think reusable pets, um, I think they're called reusable pets. So we talked about creating those, but there was the problem with the materials to use and how we can actually source the materials. So I think this is um, one thing that I really, really want to learn about. And with the coaching, as I said, I'm focusing on women empowerment because of the ideas that women have and uh, are not bold enough to come forward with them. And then there are also issues to do with self-confidence, self-esteem, and actually having the right support to go on with whatever they're thinking.
So this is what I'm currently doing, but I wish to actually do more and research more on how women can become more confident in innovating stuff. <laughs> yeah, great. Good. <laughs> and um, I'm sure we will talk uh, after the keynote of uh, of you, Mr. Rain, ag uh, again about uh, different topics, uh, especially of your keynote. And I want to tell the people out there that there is a possibility that you can join our show if you like. Uh, you can ring and um, after the keynote, for example, to to uh, uh, ask questions or say what you are thinking about uh, all the things we are talking here also about woman menstruation and uh, what topics you like. And um, you have the possibility... Um, um, oh, look, there's Ludwig. Uh, uh, you can ask him <laughs> why the sun is burning him. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you have also the possibility to uh, go um, uh, on Facebook and Twitter and uh, YouTube to write your comments or your questions. So, Ludwig, um, before we start with uh, the keynote, we want to show, um, we want to uh, tell the people who are joining in this minute, always people come and go, and uh, normally we have a second guest, uh, um, a musician. She's not uh, joining us tonight. We want to show uh, uh, two videos of her music. And um, Ludwig, can you tell, say something about her? Uh, and then we sh uh, see the first song. And after this song, we want to hear the keynote of uh, Alf. Yeah, Carolina Catun. She is a Mexican-Swiss singer. And uh, she's performing with her band The Old. They, they all live in Paris. And um, uh, she is, it's, a, it's a mixed cr crossover of jazz and South Central American folk music and Baroque and improvised music. <clears throat> um, and Carolina is a really uh, interesting person. I, uh, I met her in 2012, actually when we started moving school and she was working in, uh, we had Documenta here, uh, working with uh, Mexican artist Pedro Ríos. Uh, he's doing the sanatorium at the time and Art students were working in, in this sanatorium. He was uh, putting up as an artwork. So that's that there I, I, I worked with him too, like um, dealing with the students and situations which might be critical. And so I met Carolina and, uh, and she was really great uh, buddy to start a little bit later our first uh, workshops. And uh, at, that, at the time, I already could uh, get some taste of a beautiful voice. And she was uh, next to her art studies, you know, continuing that and taking classes. Uh, and also in the end, she was educated as a um, music therapist. So she's, she's a really very gifted, talented person. But I don't know if you like jazz, I love it. And uh, especially her way of uh, fusion of different uh, formations. So we will uh, hear two, two, uh, two songs with her band tonight. And we start with the first now. Yeah, the first song is called um, New Morning, Mosso. And um, see you after that. Para que canten los humildes de mis pagos Si hay que esperar la esperanza Más vale esperar cantando Si hay que esperar la esperanza Más vale esperar cantando Nacida de los boliches Alza su llama, su canción de largas lunas, sabe la siembra y el agua, su canción de largas lunas, sabe la siembra y el agua, como un canto de la tierra, hay que cantar. Humildes, 
flor la canta siempre como si fuera una esencia la garra hundida en el pecho hasta mirarse la pena la garra hundida en el pecho hasta mirarse la pena un corazón de camino Yeah, Carolina Cartoon. Ah, Ludwig, you're muted. <laughs> you, you were just mute, muted. Okay. <laughs> Great music. So, uh, it's not there. Spherical. Yes. So, uh, I want. Ah, okay. I'm assuming that was my cue for, for starting. Uh, my little intervention here. Uh, so I will attempt to share my screen. Yeah, this uh, will be great. <laughs> and uh, which worked when we tested it a moment ago and yeah. uh, does not seem to work quite as well right now. Um, there we go. And then I'm going to, I'm hoping you see the text moving school for Berlin, Berlin Design Week and the date of today. If you do not, do tell me because yeah, uh, I can okay. only see my own. Everything is okay. I can, I can only see my own screen now. Yeah. So in these weird COVID times, we've learned to speak to uh, uh, cameras without really knowing if anyone's out there, uh, which is always a bit scary, but also uh, brings in a certain existentialist frisson uh, to uh, the teaching or keynoting experience. So very happy to be here, uh, invited by Ludwig. Uh, who wanted me to come and speak at this moving school event, or what he described as a moving school event. I'll start by introducing myself a little bit, because a lot of you have absolutely no idea who I am, and why should you? Um, so my name is Alfred. Uh, I am originally a Finn. I'm still a Finn. I'm a Finnish citizen, uh, but have worked all over the planet, really. Uh, I am an academic. 
um, started off as kind of a critical theorist and uh, an anthropologist, did some dabbled in philosophy, and became a full tenured professor at the tender age of 31, which, if you ask anyone, is a very stupid age to become a professor. You're not supposed to become a professor when you're 31. Uh, you're supposed to become a professor when you're 61 so that you get a really nice pension. Uh, when you become a professor, when you're still basically a child and to all the 31 year olds out there uh, i do apologize for just calling you a child i'm just referring to whom i was at the time um so i kind of got very confused what am i supposed to do with my life uh, and i realized that if you become a professor at that tender age you have a certain responsibility you have a responsibility to make something of that and not just continue doing the professorial things so for the last almost 20 years I've been dedicated myself to both doing academic things, writing articles for journals who absolutely nobody reaps, but also engaging with uh, creativity, innovation, design in very practical ways. So I've done everything from advising companies, working with organizations, and uh, as I previously said, traveled the world. Right now, I'm advising a university in Equatorial Guinea. Uh, I have uh, been the first Westerner to keynote on innovation in North Korea, which was an interesting experience. And I have had the pleasure to meet uh, people like Barack Obama and Jack Welsh whilst uh, doing these strange things. And I present this because I want to see myself as a sort of a kind of border walker. I, I cross borders. I, I like borders. I, I enjoy exploring what happens when we challenge borders. And when Ludwig invited me uh, and asked what do I want to talk about, I said, well, I could talk a little bit about the work I've done for the last years uh, on trying to understand what innovation is today and, in a way, what creativity and design is today as well. And uh, particularly when it comes to the question, is all innovation equally important? Is all innovation equally good? Because we have this word we use, innovation, that we use for a ton of different things. And we're very happy to use it about ourselves, about our products, about our services. And uh, we can't seem to stop talking about how creativity and innovation will save the world. And on one level, I understand this conversation. Heck, I've been part of this conversation. But I've also been part of realizing that this conversation can be a little challenging and even problematic. So I've spent quite a few years now trying to peek behind the curtains of the innovation conversation. And uh, I've, what I've tried to do in, among other things, a book I wrote called Innovation for the Fatigued, to suggest certain engagements we might wish to open up for through which we might challenge this monolithic discourse around innovation. And instead of talking just innovation is good, innovate or die, move fast and break things, or whatever your preferred cliche about innovation is, to try to say, hmm, maybe we should ask a little bit more questions when people say, innovation, innovative, disruption, transformation. And I call this talk Between the Shallows and the Deep Blue Sea because I am a hopeless romantic and do enjoy a bit of metaphorical fun when I entitle things. And I will in this speak a little bit about deep innovation versus shallow innovation, but also some ideas I've had about what uh, the notion of problems uh, might be able to show us when we start discussing the potential, still the potential of innovation. Before I get into this, let me be academic for a moment. I'll, I'll do some funnier stuff uh, later on, but let me be a little bit academic here. A lot of what I work with has to do with trying to understand what has been known as late capitalism. Late capitalism is a term that's not very fashionable right now. It was more fashionable a little earlier on, but I think it's still useful. It was introduced by Werner Sombart, uh, the same guy who actually brought us uh, the notion of creative destruction, uh, later nicked and made more popular by Josef Schumpeter. 
But late capitalism is actually mostly connected, I think, these days to the American social theorist Frederick James. And what both of them try to kind of say with the notion of late capitalism is to say that our age, our very market-driven age, is driven not by the kind of original uh, classical capitalist logics of merely profit-seeking and uh, merely exploitation, but rather that these have become more elegant a more complex, driven also by more cultural logics as we go along. And there are a couple of things that are very clear uh, in late capitalism. And that is, on one hand, medialization. We turn everything into media, content, streams, Twitter feeds, LinkedIn groups, and so on. Media has become one of the defining characteristics of how any concept, any ideology, any notion of uh, knowledge really works in the world. Whereas earlier, a researcher might be successful simply by writing good research. These days, you want him to be, or her, obviously, I apologize for that little patronizing thing. You want him or her to be very successful in a TED talk, in a YouTube clip, uh, on uh, something like Masterclass. And so on. Medialization means that a lot of the ways in which we want to make claim that a piece of knowledge or a, a process of knowledge is valuable is that it can be medialized, communicated in an elegant fashion. The other, which has always been part of capitalism, is of course commodification that we turn things into commodities, into something that can be bought and sold. And you might say, well, isn't that? normal. I mean, obviously, things are bought and sold. Yes, but in late capitalism, surprising things get turned into commodities, something that can be purchased, bought off the shelf, if you will. Now, I'm not presenting this to try to make some kind of major Marxist point. I'm, I'm ambivalent towards uh, the, the political implications of this, but because researchers, students of late capitalism, and particularly those who've been interested in medialization and commodification, have given us actually very nice tools with which to try to understand modern concepts and how they are consumed, produced, distributed, and so on. And my personal interest is, of course, how this has played out in innovation. Now, I'm a professor of innovation. I read, lead a section of innovation. Innovation is not just my bread and butter. It is my claimed knowledge sphere. It is part of my identity. It is what I do all day, every day. At the same time, which some people know and some people don't, I have a very complicated relationship with the term innovation. Not that I'm against innovation, which I think would be a rather weird thing to be, but so that I am troubled by the fact that these days innovation is used in such a sloppy fashion and also communicated in such weird and wondrous ways that I've started to say we need to try to understand this better. Ludwig will know this, but some people might not. Even this last year and this year, the corona years, if you will, more than 100 books on creativity and innovation are published every month. If you read three books on creativity and innovation every day, you're actually not keeping up. You're falling behind. And that's just the books. To that, there is an endless amount of magazines, Twitter feeds, LinkedIn, you name it. The innovation content tsunami is absolutely astounding. We have never talked about innovation as much as we do today. And to some, that might be an, a good thing, a delightful thing, the perfect thing even. But the problem is, it's not always so that just because something is talked about a lot, that it actually becomes used in the most efficient ways. We can, for instance, see that uh, 
at least pre-COVID, the current figures are a little tricky to find that find. Uh, we spent as a global society a minimum, an absolute minimum, and I have the OECD data to back this up. I did some own calculations, so on. Three thousand billion dollars US on innovation every year. As a global society, we use three trillion dollars. Three thousand billion. That's a lot of money. To conceptualize how much money that is, that is the gross domestic product of the five Nordic countries, which are all actually considered very rich countries, Sweden, Finland, Norway, Denmark, and teeny tiny Iceland. If you combine the gross national product of those five countries, you get half of $3,000 billion. So we clearly have a lot of money that we spend on innovation. And again, you might say, fantastic. You have all this talk, you have all these books, you have all this money. Clearly, we live in the absolutely best of worlds. Now, at the same time, of course, COVID came and we weren't prepared. We'd spent billions and trillions of dollars on innovation, but nobody could even figure out initially how to produce enough face masks. And lest we forget, even during this COVID year, this year too, more than 700,000 children will die of diarrhea an illness that we've been able to actually solve for nigh on a century. So there is a mismatch. There is tremendous mismatch. We've never had more money for innovation. We've never had more knowledge about innovation. We've never had more books and talk about innovation. Yet at the same time, we're failing to solve some of the most fundamental questions on the planet. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because of late capitalism. The amount of books about innovation, or for that matter, design, have made us believe that things are okay out there. They've made us believe that everything is in hand. And they have made us believe that because there are people out there like the current heart throb of the innovation evangelists, Elon Musk, somehow will magically solve all the problems. But we're not. Because the problem with medialization and commodification is that they create a false sense of security. They create a false sense that we have things in hand. Today, you can pay, you can pay to become a master of innovation. You can take a little course, pay a little money, and you'll get a beautiful little diploma stating that you are now a master of innovation. Because innovation has become something you buy. Now, it's not real innovation. Of course it's not. It's a bloody diploma. But you feel as if it were. You can buy the book, go to the conference, invite the guru, get the diploma. And you believe that these very superficial things would actually solve something. Well, hate to be the time bringer of bad news, but they don't. What late capitalism, capitalism has shown us, most everything can be turned superficial. And that's what I claim here today. Design, innovation more, but design to a certain degree, has been turned superficial. Yes, there are fantastic designers out there. There are fantastic innovators as well. But if we look at it from a systemic level, a lot of what's happened is that we have allowed the pretty pictures on the Instagram feeds to take over from an adult conversation about what true innovation and true design engagements mean. And what this means is that we are living in a world with tremendous resources, but at the same time, a very superficial, ridiculous, reductionist, impoverished conversation about the power of innovation and design. There are glimmers of hope. I'm not saying that everything's shit, because not even I would be that arrogant. But I'm saying that we have not been good enough at doing having this conversation. 
because we can make innovation deeper than it is cur currently. We can engage with design that would actually deepen its impact. But if we want to do this, we need to start not only to speak of words such as meaning and purpose and impact, but also be prepared to bring in a critique, a real adult active critique of what is going on today. We need not just to be able to present better answers, we need to start asking better questions. And I'm fascinated by this. I'm fascinated by the fact that our discussion about questions and our discussion about problems is actually as superficial as it is. Now, I teach, among other things, innovation. I also have taught, I've been a professor of entrepreneurship, uh, and um, there are some kind of fun things that happen when you actually read how the young generations get taught these things. For instance, what are you supposed to know if you are uh, thinking about starting your own startup? Well, you can open up quite a few of the books that exist today teaching you how to become an innovator, an entrepreneur, a, a startup maven. And one of the things they will tell you is you need to solve the client's problem. Now, that is, of course, true. Uh, it is trivially true, but true nonetheless. And then they are also told, oh, you should solve the kind of pain point or problem that you yourself have. Now, this is already where these medialized books actually become dangerous. A lot of the people who start startups are... Uh, skew young, uh, often in their 20s, some obviously older, but often in their 20s. They tend to skew uh, gender-wise towards male. They tend also to skew towards being somewhat better off, the kind of person who actually can afford to go to university. So you get a tremendous amount of people who say they are solving problems. But what problems are they solving and how are they solving them? Well, I can tell you what kind of problems they're solving. They're solving problems people like me have. I am a white, straight man uh, with some disposable income. Right now, in the city of Copenhagen, I have access to four or five, I don't even bother to count anymore, services who are dedicated to the incredibly important problem of let's not make Alf cook his own dinner. They will present me with various ways of being able to have somebody else make my dinner for me. Now, I can tell you that is actually not one of the most critical problems in the world today. I can, if pushed, actually make my own damn dinner. If I wish not to make my damn dinner, I can actually go to a restaurant. Or I can pick up my iPhone and pay money to have people not just cook it, but bring it and probably feed it to me whilst I sit there uh, like the fat man in the infamous Monty Python sketch. This is not solving problems. This is overselling luxury to people who already have it damn good, because I have it damn good. I do not have problems. I have no problems. My life is fucking fantastic. Yet, there are tremendously many people who call themselves innovators or designers who are desperate to present me with even more solutions to problems I do not have. So I started thinking about problems. I started thinking about what, what are problems really? And also, how come we treat problems so superficially? How can we always kind of think that there's just a problem and you either solve it or not? A binary logic, solved, not solved. And I realized that it all starts from our very limited understanding of what even a problem is, is and also what a solution is. So I wrote a little essay on over and under solving problems. And I want to show it to you because it kind of will explain why I can engage with deep innovation later. It's not, this is not the essay, but this is sort of the model for it. I kind of said that, well, you have both undersolving and oversolving problems. And undersolving a problem is uh, to create a solution that doesn't fully 
solve the problem, but uh, go some way towards it. Uh, and then you can have oversolving, in which you create a solution that is actually totally and utterly above and beyond what actually needed to be solved. And I also pointed out that these can be both positive and negative in scope. So we start with what might be the logical place to start, negative undersolving. Uh, negative undersolving is when you are claiming you're solving a problem, but you're actually doing incredibly little. Uh, this is uh, what we call a band-aid solution or a pointless solution. Uh, one form of negative undersolving might be, for instance, that we knew that we had a problem with too much CO2 being let into the atmosphere. So a lot of countries in their infinite wisdom thought, oh, let's create a market for CO2 credits. Now, this obviously didn't hit the actual problem at all. It only created a bit of a market in which some financial uh, notions could be used to slightly change industry's approach to their carbon dioxide exhausts. Exhaust. It was an undersolving because it didn't go to the heart. It didn't even try to fully solve it. It just created this sense that we sort of are on our way to a solution, but also a very flawed and actually limited version. Now, you might say that this is uh, not that negative. You might say, oh, any kind of solution is clearly better than no solution at all. I'm not entirely sure, because this is, again, medialization. If you create negative undersolving, you might make people think that you've actually solved a problem, but the actual problem remains uh, unmanaged. But there can also be positive undersolving. Uh, in India, for instance, there is the notion of UGAD, which is a form of hacked together innovation. Uh, and in the Western world, we talk about MVPs, minimum viable products, in which we might not entirely solve the problem, but we're at least uh, presenting you a path towards a solution, uh, a cheap and quick hacked together solution that would help you a bit. Uh, one of the examples I've used, for instance, is there is a tremendous uh, amount of talk about how to support infrastructure in Africa. However, in quite a number of uh, countries in Africa, and we all know Africa's humongous continent, the different countries have very, very different kind of uh, issues, problems, demands, and potential. Um, so apologi uh, apologies for the sweeping talk of Africa. But a positive undersolving in Africa might be something as simple of trying to ship the very many used bikes that, for instance, Denmark throws away every year and ship them to Africa. Why? Well, if you are a poor cassava farmer in Uganda, a bike will not solve all your problems, but it will be a hell of a lot nicer than having to carry all your cassava to the market. It might give you a tremendous amount of extra time and time that can be translated to money so you can start solving other problems on your own. So positive undersolving, just because we have undersolved, doesn't mean we haven't made some progress. However, in the Western world, and in the design world, and in the innovation world, we tend not to undersolve problems. We tend to oversolve them. We tend to throw everything at a problem and create contraptions that are terrifically uh, over uh, kind of uh, complicated solutions to problems people might not even have. Here, I'm not sure if my video is even on, but if it is, you should probably see me holding up my iPhone. It's an iPhone 12. It has a ter terrific camera. It has a MagSafe wallet. It has pretty much every kind of entertainment you could wish for. I like it because I'm a nerd like that. But even I see that this isn't, the latest iPhone is not a, a solution really to any problem. It is an over solution because I don't need three kinds of cameras with LiDAR capabilities. I don't even know what those three cameras I now own do. I have I no idea how to use the LiDAR on this product I paid a lot of money for. But I believed in the marketing. 
and Apple is very happy to sell me this shallow uh, innovation and uh, market the holy hell out of the fact that it has a magnetic back so I can play around with a new kind of wallet. And a lot of our innovation engagement these days is this. It's negative oversolving. It's creating slightly faster lunch services for people who look like me. Instead of trying to engage with those 700,000 children that this year too will die of diarrhea. And then, of course, there is that holy grail, that field of dreams, which is positive oversolving, in which you build a platform, you build a technology like the internet, which in its early iteration does not necessarily have everything that uh, uh, the solution or the problem demanded, but we can grow into something that truly transcend, transcends what we even believed the problem to be. And I illustrate this because when I work with innovation in companies, I realize that one of the big problems is not that there isn't a desire to innovate in companies, because there is. There is so much desire to innovate. But the problem is we don't fully understand when we look at the different kinds of problems and the different kinds of ways in which we could approach them, how organizations become cultures that approach the problem of innovation in very different ways. I wrote about this in Innovation for the Fatigued, and I was, because uh, I thought I'd find something fun for Ludwig, I was actually looking for the original sketch I did for trying to understand different kinds of innovation cultures or organizations. And here it is in all its glorious ugliness. Because I started realizing when I was thinking about how organizations approach problems, that they came in broadly understood four different groups. Some of them were very kind of focused on creating the unique thing, the totally new thing, the thing nobody had thought of before. But a lot of them were very much followers, me too uh, organizations. The kind of organization who looked to whether uh, somebody else had already uh, proven that a concept worked, somebody who had already legitimized that it worked, that the media that existed around it allowed a specific kind of narrative to play out. And I realized also, when I talked to innovators, they talked about two different things. Some talked about novelty. They talked about creating what hadn't been there before, of putting basically a better spin on something that uh, uh, really stood out. They were very much in the medialization. They wanted to be hailed for having this novel thing to go up, come out. But then there was another group who didn't talk about novelty because they didn't really care about whether it was new or not. They cared about whether it had an impact, whether it mattered, whether it carried meaning. And I realized when I took these two kind of pairs of terms and created a little matrix, I could actually map a whole lot, not all, not all, there are always outliers, but a whole lot of the companies I've worked with. The ones I don't like working with all that much are the ones who are both followers, me too, and obsessed with novelty. I call those shallow innovation cultures. They can produce products, services, stuff like that, but they never really think about whether it makes any sense, whether it's very meaningful. They create an iPhone app because everyone else has an iPhone app. They create something that uses smart technology because everyone else is doing it. Right now, they're probably investing in Bitcoin. It's gone up, I think, 10% today as well. They're shallow, not because they're bad people, but because their innovation thinking is shallow, because they've stuck to the wrong things. They stuck to, is this already legitimized, the social proof? And they stuck to the sense of novelty, the media proof. 
Then there were the ones who were followers, but also were, but were interested in impact more than uh, uh, novelty. Those tended to be, uh, and I apologize for the social innovators out there who thinks I'm now belittling them, social innovators. That is, they cared about impact, but they didn't really want to explore truly novel things. Uh, a lot of the social innovators or the sustainability innovators and so on seem to be most concerned about whether they would be seen as being social, sustainable, and all these other things. They cared. They cared a whole lot. But they also cared about how they looked, about how they were perceived. And they wanted that social proof, that confirmation. I was always more interested in the unique ones, the ones who tried to kind of fight a truly novel fight, a fight and do something that nobody had done before. But there too, there was a difference. There was those who were trying to be unique, but they were still too obsessed with the novelty, whether it would play well in the media. And those were the show-offs. And the number one company here I have to mention, because I'm not saying being a show-off is all bad, is Tesla. Tesla is a wonderful company in many ways. They do a lot of fun stuff. Uh, it's interesting to see how they work, but they are show-offs. They are more obsessed with the novelty of a new design, a new approach, than with truly making an impact. And that leads me to that fourth quadrant. Those who try to create something unique and do it with impact. And I claim there are far too few of these deep innovators out there today. And it's not because we're not smart. It's not because we don't have money, because we have both smarts and money. But because we as a society have been too caught up in the web of late capitalism, too caught up in how it plays in the media, too caught up in our Instagram society, that we have not created the kind of foundation upon which deep innovators can truly build. Now, some do it anyway. I'm working with a company that is transforming sunlight into drinkable water and is trying to find technologies to bring drinkable, cheap water powered by solar energy to the most aggrieved parts of Africa. And that, to me, is deep innovation. Creating something nobody has done before and doing that in an impactful way. So there are, they are out there, but there are, too, there are too few of them, and we need to talk about them more seriously. Because right now, a lot of them do not feel the love. They feel that they've gotten hid behind more flashy, more uh, media-friendly innovations, and they're not seen for their innovative impact because our innovation discourse has become so superficial and weak. And deep innovation and the work towards deep innovation, it's a journey. It is not something that I can teach you how to do in a few, quick little keynote. It is a question of a creating a social journey, a journey for our entire society, a journey for our, journey for our world. And why do I talk about this? Why am I claiming that this kind of stuff is important? Well, I'll try to use my few last minutes to tell you why. I love innovation. I believe innovation is the pathway to solving the wicked problems we have in the world. The ecological crisis, the social inequality, the coming aging society, and many other things besides. We have a lot of problems that need solving, including those 700 needlessly dying children. But we can only start solving them if our innovation debate gets better. Right now, it's too dominated by flashy American magazines, by what gets published in Harvard Business Review, what gets picked up by Fast Company, what plays well in a podcast. What we need on a societal level is a 
thorough reappraisal of how we talk about innovation and whether we have enough terminology, enough models to truly engage with innovation. It's all its diverse goodness. The two matrices I showed you are very simple little things, but they are teeny tiny step, steps towards a richer innovation debate in which we at least can ask what kind of problem solving is this? What kind of innovation culture is this? And we need to do this because today so much of what I read about and see about innovation is what I call, borrowing a term from Steve Blank, innovation theater. Corporations engaging with innovation with no aim to change anything, but only to show we too have young people who can play the disruption game. Or even worse, what I've called innovation pornography in which these magazines present innovation tales that in their falseness, in their glib narratives and their technical representations are as close to real innovation as pornography is to a stable, meaningful human relationship. Because the commodification and the medialization, I started by pointing out, has not just kind of hampered innovation, it has turned it in, the, the discourse around it, into a perversion of what it should be. So what I'm talking about here, what I'm championing here, is developing an innovation critique. Not being critical to innovation, that's different, but in an innovation critique. Just like we are fully aware that you can critique a movie, because not all movies are equally good. We should be able to critique innovation and innovation books and innovation engagements and ask difficult questions about them. And we need to do this because the level of the problems we will be facing with the climate, with aging, with social inequality, are so complex that we need an entirely new level of innovation ambition. One that doesn't accept negative under or negative oversolving. One that doesn't kind of think that because a lot of books are published that the real problems are being faced. We need a new level of ambition, and we can only gain this if we get a better societal conversation about all that innovation can be and the problems that of that, what it has become. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> yeah, whoa. My, my camera is a little bit, I'm frozen, mm -hmm. yeah, at the moment. But there will be no problem. <laughs> um. Thank you very much, Alf. Um, it, it was kind of exactly I hoped you would talk about, because that was this thing which was touching at your second book. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think you made a really strong point today. And I'm, I'm really happy because uh, this video can, you know, will stay on YouTube and, you know, people in our team moving school and others can still watch it and, and uh, also be challenged by it because that's what, you, what you're doing. And um, that's really, I think, what, what we need right now. And that I, hopefully it's seen by a lot of people who are participating in Berlin Design Week because I feel for a long time that in this design or innovation scene, uh, as you say, there's a lot of um, showing off shallowness and, uh, um, you know, apply or, yeah, and, and it's, it's also so tempting, you know, it's not that I'm um, over it. it, it's, it's, you know, it draws me into it. One, one should be very clear here. Uh, what I'm 
and I know I can come off as a bit bombastic and, and preachy at times, and I, I do apologize for that. <laughs> but here, the point is not to condemn everyone who, who engages with shallow things. Lord knows I've written a fair few things that could be seen as shallow. I've worked with advertising and marketing that didn't really move the social needle any in any direction i've done i'm a sinner as we all are uh and uh, and i often make this point when i talk to larger audiences is no no the point is not to kind of figure out who's the bad guy in the room the point is not finger pointing or going uh oh you're not deep enough and you're not engaging with the right things it is to stimulate a conversation it is to kind of start saying, uh, yeah, uh, some of the stuff we do, as one CEO, uh, a, a, nice, a nice guy friend of mine kind of said, yeah, a lot of the stuff we do is, is shallow innovation. But you know what? We're going to keep doing those because they bring in quite a lot of money. And I need that money to keep coming in. But I'm going to try to make a few things that kind of answer to this, your question here. I'm, I'm going to try to do a couple of engagement that might be a little bit more about this deep innovation, that have a little bit more of social impact, that that ask that answers harder questions, and that's that's I think all I can even dream of. We live in a the world we live in, uh, so we all need to kind of survive. Uh, a startup, uh, if it gets money for one thing, uh, then it should definitely do that thing because uh, that's what it got money for. We shouldn't condemn the the vaults and the just eats and uh, waitiers and uh, DoorDash and Foodora and uh, all the different kinds of uh, food delivery services that are out there. They've gotten money for doing food delivery. They do a good service. It's it's fine. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not trying to condemn them. What I'm trying to condemn is people like me. People like me who work with this and do not talk about this. Do not talk about the fact that we could do so much better. Who do not talk about the fact that whilst I can use my fancy iPhone uh, and uh, my salary to, to order whatever kind of food I can imagine, there are still enormous amounts of children in Africa that do not have clean drinking water or toilets. And mm. on some level, that is just wrong. That is, that is societal, on a societal level, wrong. Mm. Why are we putting hundreds of millions into let's get Alf fatter and so much <laughs> less into let's save children? That's that's my entire point. That's we mm -hmm. need as a society to become better at saving children and stop trying to make me so fat. Mm -hmm. The the theme of the uh, Berlin Design Week is uh, um, looking out for new traditions. You know, because so many things are questioned right now, and also like I think on on the first of June there's a a, a day. Uh, um, about education of design so you know so so where to start because i i feel or i've seen so many students or other also uh, you know other adults who really want to do something they want to change something even business students you know i had this <laughs> misconception that business students you know just want to make money but i i was convinced that a lot of them now in this generation really tell me I want to do it differently. So um, then uh, in the consequence, uh, design education or innovation education or whatever has to change, right? So mm -hmm. how, how to start that change in education? Well, I think that the, the first step uh, needs to be to to create a, an understanding of the problem, as in the societal mm. problem, the graveness of it. We we recently redid uh, uh, our master's program in uh, product development and innovation, and uh, we sort of obsessively turned it towards sustainability. Kind of said, listen, 
This is not a program about how to create more products, because frankly, we don't need that many more products. We have too many products already. Look around you in your flats. I mean, there, there is stuff absolutely everywhere. And, and I'm sort of a minimalist, and there's still too much stuff in my flat. Uh, so, so we started from, it's, this is not a program about how to create more, but how to create better. So everything comes down to, okay, how do we plan for the circular economy? How do we plan for continuous reuse? How do we utilize digital tools, not just for uh, uh, creating more, but actually creating better? Uh, and how do we bring in different perspectives uh, into this? Um, so an engagement, which I think was, was quite uh, fascinating that uh, a colleague of mine did was they, they kind of brought in the question of uh, the unborn. So often when we kind of talk about design, of course, you know, user-centric and all these kind of words we kind of throw around. Yeah? And then we, of course, mean somebody that we could face, somebody we could see. But who is actually the most important person for contemporary design? <laughs> I would claim it is my unborn grandson. <laughs> I do not have a grandson. Uh, I wish not to have a grandson very quickly because I do not wish to be a grandfather. I barely feel <laughs> adult uh, yet. Uh, so, so, uh, but at some point I will have a grandson. I, I think uh, I have three kids, so one of them will probably procreate. Um, and I kind of look and think. So I'm going to die before the ecological crisis destroys the world. That's a simple fact. I'm, I'm not going to hang around. I'm, I'm old. I mean, even with good, we don't. We will destroy the world if we can keep doing what we're doing, but it'll take about a hundred years, and I'm going to be dead in fifty, even with really advanced uh, medicine. So, so I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to be fine. And uh, my son, my older son, is his oldest son is twenty five. So he's going to be, and when I'm dead, he's going to be like seventy five. Uh, so, so he probably won't hit that problem. But his son, because he still doesn't have, hasn't kind of gotten a son, or my youngest son, youngest son's potential uh, child, he's he's only eight, so he has a lot of time ahead of him. And I'm kind of thinking about those grandchildren. Um, so, I said, okay, so how do we design? For instance, um, uh, we we work a lot with wind power. Uh, wind power is a big thing in Denmark, is he? How do we create a recycling and circular economy logic for energy production that takes the unborn, so the unborn children, the children that may be born in 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, into account? And that changes your mindset. That changes kind of how you think about things. But now you're not doing user-centric. Now you're kind of thinking about how how... Did you even plan for stuff that happens after you're dead? How, mm. how do you act in the now to make sure that once you're long gone, your errors do not negatively affect the by now unborn? Mm. And again, I'm not saying that that little exercise would change the world. Uh, we have to be realists still. But we have to work with these tiny steps to kind of try to say, there is still so much to do. There is still so many. So, so many of the basics we still haven't dealt with. And I'm, we, we talked about uh, menstruation poverty in Zimbabwe, for instance. And menstruation poverty, of course, is a, a problem in far more places than Zimbabwe. Women have menstruated for, uh, depending on where you start counting from, uncountable years. And we still haven't solved this incredibly basic problem. How shit are we as humanity? I mean, we are, we are terribly bad at solving problems, really. We are, we are, we're awful. We have still to build a society in which... Uh, kind of clean water and a toilet is guaranteed to everyone. Mm -hmm. And then we go on and go, oh, isn't the iPhone 12 a tremendous development? No, 
It's not. It is a symbol about how fucked up our society is. Mm. No. Sorry, I'm, I'm yeah. getting into ranting now here. But Alf, Alf, what do you what do you think? Because uh, when you're talking about your daughter or your uh, son, of your son, <laughs> um, and we have to think of these uh, generations today, because in Germany the highest court also said this to our politicians that they have to um, think of these uh, generations, the unborn generation. Mm -hmm. But if if it's it's still a problem to think on the generations at the planet at the moment, yeah, we don't mm -hmm. solve problems. You always say um, we have today, and how we can transfer thinking about problems we have in the future i'm always ask how we can find a way to to give these people uh, give the people this kind of uh, thinking i think what we're going to have to accept as a society i mean some some of my more radical colleagues would say that we need a degrowth strategy that our entire economic system is built on continuous growth, continuous expansion, and that the time uh, for that is ended because we cannot grow eternally. I mean, there, there, there is a limit to growth. I'm not quite that uh, extreme, I would say. I believe that there is still potential but we we might need to think about not if not degrowth then at least a cutting back that is do we need to expand in every uh, kind of uh, uh, kind of human activity do we need to kind of have this uh, free for all uh, for everything do you have in any idea of how many flavors of potato crisps are out there in the world <laughs> Do you? Do you want to? Do you want to? Do you want to wager a guess? Yeah. Five hundred. Seven. There are several thousand. <laughs> Seven. You're closer. You're definitely closer. I mean, it's a pro. It's somewhere in the five thousand uh, kind of category. Last time I tried to explore this. Now, I'm. I do like a potato crisp. I'm. 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 <laughs> Yes, yeah. As I said, the world is working to make me fatter for some yeah. reason. I don't know when we decided that should be our main task, but uh, seemingly it is. I'm sort of just saying, maybe we only need a thousand flavors of potato crisps. We could cut back with 80% and still there would be enough space for squid ink potato chips uh, and, and a few really weird flavors. We don't need to, to kind of go the whole hog. I don't know if you've ever traveled uh, extensively in China, but if you go to some of the factory cities in China and see how these are churning out variations of products that are, are basically just designed for obs uh, obsolescence, that are designed for landfills, they're, they're just churning them out in case somebody might theoretically buy them, because that's how our economic logic works today. You throw shit at the wall and see what sticks. We've all seen the graveyards of the e-scooters. So we at one point decided, let's produce tens, if hundreds of thousands of e-scooters and see if anyone wants them. Okay, no, oh, well, let's throw them in a landfill then. It's, mm -hmm. it's this. It's this. We don't need degrowth, but we might kind of pull a little on the handbrake and go, yeah, maybe we've overexpanded here. We, we, we don't need... And of course, then comes the question, am I, am I talking about government control of the world? Well, I would love to live in a world in which corporations had enough sense and a desire to collaborate that they could actually govern themselves. Uh, and, and I do hope this, but the free, the totally free market, it can do wondrous things, but it, it is also a rather wasteful system. So we need a better system. And if I could, knew exactly what that better system was, I would be a genius on level that every Nobel Prize should be given to me right now. And I'm not a genius on that level. I'm not a genius on any level, as Ludwig well knows. Uh, I'm just a guy who kind of looks at the world and goes, do we need this many flavors of cheese? 
Do we need this many flavors of potato crisps? How many kind of citrus presses does the world truly need? <laughs> so yes, I thought I too like to like Stark's uh, citrus press for Alessi. It was a delightful intervention. Uh, but at some point you kind of have to go say basta, enough. Uh, there are problems out there that are more uh, kind of central than just how elegant can you make uh, your citrus press. <laughs> I, uh, I just want, yeah, like I'm, before you say, I just want to uh, take in the audience. You know, if there's anybody out there who wants to comment or ask a question, please uh, write in the chat or call, you know. Uh, but there's no number. No, it's there's yeah, no. but but <laughs> it's a <laughs> chat. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the the telephone number is this one. Mm -hmm. But the, um, yeah. the people are listening um, quite well. But only thank you, thank you for this uh, keynote and all this uh, stuff. We have no question at the moment, so they like our uh, discussion. So, Gamu. Gamu. Yeah, um, Alpha, I, I want to start uh, by saying thank you so much for challenging my thoughts. I think there's a lot to think about, especially uh, for someone like me, a young person who's also trying to see a better world for our generation. Um, so this morning I was having a conversation, right, with someone who's studying design. I think they're studying communication and design. And we were talking about all these great ideas that they have. And I was just looking at them and saying to myself, wow, how can a person be so creative? But after they said everything, and so we were trying to figure out a way to move forward, then they're like, everything else is being done, or there's someone who's doing way better than I'm doing. So it seems as if with the Instagram society that you talked about and young people being into things that are flashy and all that kind of stuff, we have people who really want to innovate certain things that are helpful to our society, but they kind of like hold themselves back because of this noise that is out there. So how do we come out of that? That's actually a very good, very good point. And, uh... It, it's interesting. I, I've been teaching this class on, on uh, theories and methods of technological change because there is this notion that uh, the internet and every kind of more efficient communication actually improves uh, innovation and so on. And it does in certain respects. But if you look way back, if you look back to not just the 20th century, but to the 19th century, when Rapid communication meant that your letter might be delivered uh, within a country within a week. Uh, you had so many kind of inventors and uh, people testing stuff out that had no idea what was going on elsewhere in the world. So you actually had lots more experimentation going on because you could never check an Instagram feed to see if somebody else thinking of the same. Ah, oh, there are. Well, well, no point then. So. I think you're absolutely right. A lot of energy in experimentation, invention, and so on has been crushed by the possibility of being able to Google, oh, somebody else did already did something even better. So no point in me even starting. Because, of course, how do you create the better thing? To start, your first idea is always terrible. I mean, I, I'm a full believer in that our early ideas are always half bake nonsense we get we, we believe oh maybe i could build a better rat trap and it would have it not just cheese but it would it would have a kind of a, a cheese and then a metal alloy thing and then you start building it and you realize my god i have no idea what i'm doing but you keep building and then after a while you realize oh this is actually isn't a rat trap but it could be a really good way to to improve uh, toilet design or whatever. Yeah? So so you, if we want innovation, oh. we need to have people experimenting with weird stuff. But now when we're teaching kids as well that no, no, you need to do the research. Are you solving a real problem? Are you user centric and all the kinds of cliches we're working? Have you done your uh, business model innovation canvas? Um, it, I like Alex. Alex is a swell guy. I don't want to criticize Alex at all. Uh, I supported him before the even book came out, so so don't get me wrong. But I mean, we, we get caught up in these externalities. And I'm kind of going, no, just just 
start working. Uh, I'm not artistic at all. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not, uh, I like art, but, but I'm not artistic or creative in that way. But I love working with artists, uh, including a wonderful musician friend. And why do I like working with artists? Because artists dedicate themselves, they throw themselves into something, and they work with their hands. Artists are the true manual laborers. Of course, these are metaphorical hands. Some work with their voice, some work with their words, but it's all about actually doing. And a writer, a good, a decent writer, a good, a proper writer, doesn't care about whether the story has been told before. They kind of work on the story. It's what stories are really about: boy meets girl, uh, girl gets kidnapped by ninjas, boy kills ninjas. And so, I mean, all stories have already been told. So, so an author sits there, knows my story has been told. I'm going to work on it anyway and just tell it. All artists know that we are people have thrown paint on canvases for for thousands of years, but they still go there and they do the work. And that's what we need from from young designers and young innovators. Go into the lab, go and 3D print something. Do the work. Work with your hands. It, it's going to be messy. It's going to be wrong. You're going to have to redo it. Uh, what you thought was looked brilliant is going to fail, and still you keep working. So, I mean, we need, in a sense, an, a work ethic for innovation and design. And uh, again, I'm not trying to condemn young people who who get caught up in imposter syndrome, who get caught up in, well, this doesn't look good on Instagram. But I mean, my work, often with young people, is, is to kind of sit down uh, with them and say, don't get it right, get it written. Don't, don't try to get it perfect, you're going to fail. It, it's fine. Uh, when I supervise master's thesis, which I do a lot these days, uh, I'm going to go, no, no, you know, getting a result which says this failed, that's a result too. Don't be afraid of that. You just work and hope that over time, uh, you sort of uh, have moved the needle a little bit. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you the dirty secret of all writers. Uh, I've published 18 books, I think, if you count all the academic ones and the smaller ones and stuff like that. I've probably written at least 20 more. And sometimes I look at them and I cringe at the absolute utter shit I've written. Uh, but that's okay. That's what a writer does. A writer sits down, bashes the keyboard, hopes that what comes out can be salvaged somehow. Sometimes it can't, and then you put it back into the drawer and you hope nobody ever sees it again. Uh, and, and that's what we need. We need more work. We need uh, just to dare to fail and, and to try to make meaningful, impactful stuff uh, and not get too caught up in the medialization of it all. Hmm. Yeah. But does it mean we are also lacking empathy? Because the question is, um, I mean, if we have access to all these information, you know, how bad the world is, how, or, I mean, you know, how many people are suffering. And I mean, Gamo, you can, can talk about your country in Africa. So why is it not getting us? I mean, why or how can we um, work for that, that, As you said, people are more looking in that or affected by that. I'm gonna. I mean, it would be delightful to hear hear uh, kind of a, a, a Zimbabwean voice uh, for this as well. But but I'm gonna I'm gonna. Uh, so Ludwig and I don't know each other all that well. I mean, we've we've emailed and we've chatted and so on. But um, uh, sometimes in Ludwig's emails. Uh, Uh, certain uh, theological points pop up. We, we discussed the Pentecost uh, recently, for instance. Um, and I'm not, I'm personally agnostic. Uh, that is, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm a non-cognitivist when it comes to theological issues, and we can have a, a theological debate about that later. But, but I'm also have been for a long time interested in theolo theological arguments. 
because I, I think that we've missed a trick in a sense of realizing that a lot of uh, kind of theology has actually discussed themes that could be uh, productive in other fields as well. And there is one theological concept that I find incredibly powerful and, and forgotten often, and that is the notion of mercy. Mm. That is, how do we show mercy, not just towards others, but also towards ourselves? Mm. And quite often when I talk, work with leaders, for instance, one of the things that they struggle with is that they hold themselves to such high standards that they mm. actually end up burnt out because they feel like continuous failures. And some innovators and uh, which were also some young people, they, they also kind of set standards that are never reachable. reachable. So I, I believe that we need a conversation societally about, about showing mercy. Uh, and that's why I came back time and time again to I'm not trying to say uh, Tesla is bad or Elon Musk is horrible or or if you do a, a food delivery service, you're, you're a terrible human being. I mean, no, no, I, I, my heart goes out to these people. But I do believe that we need a conversation about humility and mercy towards everyone. And uh, we need to accept that, for instance, our engagements in Africa which have been many, and Lord knows many of them have failed in, in spectacular ways. We should show mercy towards that. It's, it's not easy to, to change a uh, situation in after hundreds of years of colonialism, uh, after a complex messing up of uh, basically drawing uh, country lines with a ruler completely ignoring the cultural boundaries that you completely ignore whilst doing so. There's so much. But at the same time, we can't get caught up in this continuous, oh, it's, it's just wrong, all these horrible people did wrong thing. We need to kind of go, yes, errors were made. We need to show mercy towards that and go, let's move on. Let's get to the next level. Let's get to the next step. And we need to show mercy towards ourselves. I mean, I struggle with this. I kind of look, and uh, <laughs> it's it's funny because when you when you work with borders, when when you challenge things, uh, the things I got from I wrote a book called Dangerous Ideas, and uh, the number one criticism I got was those ideas were dangerous enough. I, I don't I don't think you are very radical at all. And I go, oh, sorry. And then I feel bad for a little while. I go, mm, yes, I probably should have thrown in more kind of really radical stuff. There was no cannibalism in there, as I recall. So maybe I should have kind of pushed the cannibalism angle a little bit. And then I go, no, it was a book. I tried to make a point. It wasn't perfect, but I have to accept it was what it was. And with innovation for the fatigued, it was, oh, you didn't push the envelope and it wasn't radical enough. You have to kind of, let's crush capitalism. I go, oh, Christ, do I have to fix capitalism or, or the entire kind of global economic system? I'm, I'm, I have shit to do. I have dinner to cook. I, I, and then I kind of go, yeah, no, no, it's, it's okay. You don't solve all problems just because you wrote a bloody book. And... I'm talking about this specifically because I, what I'm sort of talking about is, is humility and mercy. We need to be humble in the face of the fact that you know, our innovation conversation hasn't been all that terrific. We, we need to, to humble ourselves in the face of this and go, oh, yeah, there's been a lot of bullshit said and a lot of stuff could have been done better. But there also needs to be mercy, which is, yeah, it's a difficult question. We, we won't have perfect answers, so, so we, we muddle through. We, we try our best and hope that at least we uh, don't make things worse. And it comes back to the old Hippocratic Oath. That I'm not sure if doctors swear this any longer, but the, the old Hippocratic Oath that all doctors were supposed to uh, swear was, uh, part of it was, the first rule is, or first of all, do no harm that all doctors should start by doing no harm. 
And these days, I don't think they do that any longer. I don't think they swear the oath. But I'm, I'm kind of going, we should all swear that oath. First of all, do no harm. And I try to live my life so that I do, well, as little harm as I can. And, and try to, when I do something, kind of go, okay, so, so am, I, am I being part of the solution or part of the problem? And I try to be part of the solution. And um, I, I try to so, show myself mercy when I'm not. But yeah, that's, that's sort of what I'm trying to do. <laughs> and uh, Gamu, um do you think you have to be merciful for for us in the west uh i i have to really uh choose my words right because this is kind of a touchy topic if i can put it that way but um yeah i think i totally agree correct me if i'm wrong like in this society that we're living in now i have a feeling that there is uh this notion of me myself and i versus we together so i kind of <laughs> yeah so um going back to like um let's talk about maybe developments in africa and what's happening in africa and how we can actually develop africa i always look at um the education system and you know the process of actually change and wanting to have better and wanting to do better um and i'm thinking about as we show mercy as we practice humility as we focus on you know humanity and improvements we also need to focus on this it's it's us together not me wanting to do better for myself so i think that's that's what i can say i hope i hope i really answered your question because i think this is a really touchy topic and i wouldn't want to throw you know away the wrong words so to speak but yeah i, I yeah. totally agree we need to show mercy and we need to move on from whatever might have happened in the past because i think there is no progress in focusing on what could have been. So it's, we are here now. So what can we do to move forward? Mm. It's, um, it's interesting. If you look, for instance, at uh, the reconciliation committees in South Africa, uh, post apartheid, uh, the, the amount of work that actually had to be done to, to kind of show mercy and uh, to, to move forward. And, and I do think there is still many, many forms of reconciliation that has to be directed towards Africa. It is, it is a uh, deep, uh, there are some deep traumas there. And of course, we should remember um, the, the, the problems are not just kind of the West against Africa. It's uh, there's also kind of the the uh, West supporting structures in Africa by Africans that should not have been supported. Uh, if you have the time, the brilliant book Dictator Land, which looks looks at the dictatorships in in Africa, is is uh, incredibly eye opening about just how complex uh, the issues that plagued many of even the most uh, the wealthiest uh, African nations were. So it's not they're, they're, these are not clear cut problems. These are truly wicked problems of uh, uh, old colonial histories, uh, corrupt systems in the here and now, which is not just Western systems, but also internal African systems that were corrupt, and collusion between uh, various kinds of agents, including corporations, including Western nations, including, well, everything from, uh, from uh, intra-tribal strife and, uh, and ish other issues in Africa. It is, uh, it is truly a mind-bogglingly complex uh, problem to, to deal with. But, uh, but at the same time, we, we also need to be prepared to say that, yeah, mistakes were made. <laughs> And a fairly humongous, uh, life-changing, deeply structural mistakes. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, I wanted to ask on um, also ideas and innovations because I'm this kind of person, right? I think Ludwig knows this. We always talk about this, that sometimes I get carried away with ideas. It's like I think of something, then the next thing I'm like, okay, we can do that. We can do this. But 
I believe and I know that for me to actually do something that's tangible, I probably need to focus on one idea and one thing. So how can you, what, what tips and what advice would you have for someone who has ideas and someone who's really keen on uh, contributing something positive to the society, but they are not doing anything because they're just kind of, you know, um, daydreaming or they kind, of, they kind of don't know which idea to focus on and what to really explore? I mean, the, I could probably speak about this for eight hours uh, and, and still there would be many other things not to be said. And I, I believe we need to round off fairly soon uh, so as not to, to completely mess up our schedules. But um, if there is one advice uh, I, I could give in connection to this, uh, it would simply be this. If you try to find the best idea and you sit there and go through all the ideas analytically, measure them on various uh, scales and so on, and trying to find the one, the, the perfect one, you will never ever innovate because that is endless work. The true innovators tend to be the ones who, who just take any idea. Just take one idea. It doesn't matter if it's the best idea. It doesn't matter if it seems the most impactful. Just take one idea and develop that. Because all great innovations have started from very sketchy, very unclear backgrounds. And uh, they have grown as you work with them. I'm a huge fan of using... Uh, kind of private life analogies. And here too, uh, I think that something which I see a lot in, in the younger generation uh, comes through, with, which I actually have kind of said, this is sort of a problem for, for how uh, the future of innovation is going to look. It's the Tinder problem. Now, I'm not a, uh, I, I don't moralize about how people meet up, but Tinder, I think, is deeply problematic. Because what, what is Tinder? Well, Tinder is like this perfect smorgasbord, cavalcade uh, of buffet of ideas. <laughs> and you kind of go, yes, yes, no, yes, yes, no, yes. yes. And, and you can go do that forever. Because Tinder basically tells you, if you just keep swiping, magic will happen and the person of your dreams will appear. Now, I'm old enough to be able to say this is not how deep, meaningful relationships actually work. Because if you keep swiping, hoping that the, the one turns up, you will swipe for fucking ever. <laughs> Real relationships means you meet somebody, you accept the fact that they're not perfect, because frankly... None of us are perfect. I mean, I know Ludwig is pretty close, but but uh, none of the, the rest of us are are fun, fundamentally imperfect. Uh, and then you meet somebody else imperfect, and then you try to actually work with that relationship. And then sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. And it can take years to actually realize this actually was yes, this this actually is the thing. Uh, and I'm not trying to be facetious or, or kind of stu uh, make stupid analogies here. But I mean, the thing that sets innovators apart is they don't treat innovation as Tinder. They don't keep swiping, looking for the best idea. Because that swiping thing, it will never bring you true joy, true happiness. They find something, go, huh, I can work with this. And then they kind of go through the difficult work of trying to make that one idea work and to make realize to make it something grand. Just like a relationship is hard work, innovation is hard work. And without trying again to be too kind of cutesy, uh, when I see how young people today approach relationships, I kind of sometimes worry a bit about if, if you truly believe this is how the world works, swipe your way to happiness, I'm not sure we're going to have a tremendous, uh, tremendous kind of development. Exactly. Um, 
and and I think this too needs to be part of innovation critique. Uh, is that I often am far. A final story, and then I'll shut up. I can I, I know how to shut up. You might not know, might not believe me, but I, I I am I actually have the capability. I had two students uh, when I was a professor of entrepreneurship and innovation in Stockholm. Very smart students. I like them a lot. They particularly because they were they were kind of geeks and nerds and intellectuals, and they they wanted to do really kind of intellectual, not very pragmatic things. And uh, they wrote their master's thesis for me on trust in digital networks and and really kind of more sociological stuff. And there was a really guy. And I wanted to hire them as doctoral students. And I offered them because I had the money at the time. So I said, "Hey, come here. Let's let's you you come in my group. I'll make doctoral students." And they said, "Yeah, you. That sounds really nice and, and that's fun. But you know, we had this other idea. You know, we're really both into uh, kind of." art music, because they were really into kind of very bizarro arty uh, uh, music stuff. One of them really liked uh, recording church bells and stuff and then edit that into uh, kind of weird soundscapes and so on. Uh, and said, so we want to kind of create a platform uh, in which people who are really into these kind of weird electronic music we're into can kind of put, share their stuff and then comment and so on. And I look, listen to them and say, boys, I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I love you, but, but that doesn't sound very smart. I mean, that's basically a crippled YouTube. You're going to be eaten alive. Uh, who nobody cares enough about a complex electronic. I'm sorry. I mean, of course, if you, I'm not going to hold it against you that you don't kind of become a, a doctoral students, but yeah, do you want to invest? No. Uh, <laughs> And that company was SoundCloud, uh, which Ooh. was close to becoming a unicorn. So, yes, the, the guys who founded SoundCloud, a Berlin-based company, by the way, they're now doing some stuff with electric, uh, electric bikes in, in Berlin. Uh, they were my students, and they presented their idea, and I didn't believe them. Uh, and goes to show... The early versions of an idea are shit. That doesn't mean you can't become insanely rich developing them and, uh, and turning them into almost a unicorn. So, um, yeah, it's the execution, not the idea. A great final. <laughs> Thank you very much for this uh, yeah, discussion, this conversation. And um, But really, we, uh, yeah, we shot... Be long behind our schedule <laughs> yeah we can we can we can put them apart you know we have like a like a series oh, and and i think uh, yeah it would be great to have you back uh, and talk a little bit more of you know how to find your mate and and this is it's really great to listen to you um and uh, um I am, I'm sure that a lot of people will also um, like it to, to watch it on YouTube, you know, if they missed it tonight. And thank you so much, like giving us your Saturday night. We, we made it earlier for you. Um, <laughs> now, it's, now it's almost as late. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that great gift and I okay. hope to talk to you more. Yes, and this has yes. been really fun. Thanks for everyone. Uh, thanks for, for having me on. Thanks for great questions and, and great insights. And uh, talk soon again, everyone. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you very much to Copenhagen. Take care. Take care. Stay yeah. safe out there. Okay. Bye. <laughs> so we'll have uh, um, um, a song for closing from Carolina Cartoon and Teol. And I have missed to introduce the band so we have the double bassist nicolas moreau we have the guitarist pierre Pachot, and we have the percussionist and drummer arthur arthur allard and of course carolina if you're still there uh, get better and hope to see you soon and thanks for your music yeah but 
um, we have to t to say a few words because uh, we are tomorrow. We are not uh, on the show. Mm. We are back on Monday, and uh, so if you like to join us, uh, then we are back at 2021, the time of the year, <laughs> and uh, yeah. And now have a nice evening and Gamu, nice to have you in our team. Thank you. Nice to have you too. I'm happy. <laughs> a caballo y en la selva me metí un día monté a caballo y en la selva me metí y sentí que un gran silencio crecía dentro de mí
quiera vivir feliz.